Hi everyone again, my name's Hamza. Uh, I'm the lead optometrist for Specsavers in Kendall. I'm better known as the crazy optom on Instagram, where I image and share cases of what I come across in my day-to-day -day practice life. This lecture came about because I often get asked, how do I take my images and how do I take images well, to using just my phone and no fancy equipment. So I teamed up with the great guys at AOS to show you first of all how to take images and then what can be done with those images to improve practice and patient life. So what we're going to do today in today's lecture is teach you the basics of how to achieve a successful image, how to refine your technique when imaging various structures, understand the benefits imaging can bring to patients and your practice, and then introduce you to the AOS 3.0 software, which Jeff and Natalie will hopefully take you through later as well. So why do we image? So there's main, three main reasons why we image. So patient education, patient management, and peer education and safety. So for years, retinal imaging and more recently OCT has been commonplace in practice to aid examinations and help educate patients about the health of the eyes. It's strange to think bar few practices with digital slit lamp, anterior eye imaging isn't actually the norm in practice. Considering technology has moved so quickly and actually imaging has formed such a massive part of our day-to-day -day life and practice as well. We all know it's much more impactful and engaging to show a patient their own eyes instead of just a simple diagram or a grading, grading scale. For example, showing an uncontrolled diabetic the actual bleeds and leakages at the back of his own eyes when trying to express the importance of control is going to have much more of an impact on that patient than simply showing him a diagram of what could happen uh, or a simple verbal explanation. The same can be said about, said of anterior eye issues, whether it's something as simple as explaining blepharitis or dry eyes to a patient and showing them the debris buildup on the lashes or the staining on the front of the eye to something more serious as saying explaining a corneal ulcer to a patient particularly a contact lens patient and stressing the importance of hygiene and lens care with those patients as well we all know the public perception of optometry can sometimes be um, shifted towards that we're just glasses salespeople. And obviously over the past few years especially with the introduction introduction of enhanced optical services within practice such as MEX uh, it highlights the healthcare aspect of optometry to the public and this is where imaging already with the posterior eye imaging that we have in practice helps highlight how important the health of the eye is. Anterior eye imaging is only going to add to that importance of healthcare and shifting the public perception towards that we are a healthcare profession. And obviously naturally the wow factor. Obviously we know how impressed patients are by the improvements in technology especially with imaging whether that's optomap and OCT or just normal retinal photography. The same can be said of an anterior eye image showing the patient their own eyes and showing them a really interesting image um, can be really helpful in giving you a unique selling point when, about the services that you offer in your practice as well. When it comes to patient management, imaging is really important the same way it is really important for tracking uh, changes or managing a patient when we're looking at stuff at the back of the eye. So whether it's tracking a patient in a dry eye clinic to see the improvements in the lid or to see the changes of staining over time or managing an abrasion or an ulcer to resolution as well. The addition, the anterior eye imaging is invaluable to practice life because it helps you um, objectively track issues, say where you're managing a patient between multiple clinicians as well. You've got a visual aid there rather than just relying on somebody's notes. It also aids in hospital triaging, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, hospital departments are stretched and appointment availability is very sparse. So being able to provide, it's already best practice to provide retinal photography, OCTs and visual fields. Same can be said of anterior eye imaging to help aid that triage process to make sure the patients that need to be seen with the utmost urgencies are seen first. And by giving the hospital all the av available information, they can make that decision appropriately as well. And most recently, especially in some parts of the country, new tele-ophthalmology services are available where you can actually dial in directly to an ophthalmologist and go through a digital slit lamp um, assessment with them, showing them what you're seeing and they can actually provide care remotely. So by providing care remotely, you're in Providing care remotely, you're improving the patient um, experience and um, removing any barriers to care with the patient. Lastly, peer education and safety. So part of the reason that I started the Crazy Opton page and got involved with all this is because I was inspired by the likes of Jordical Retina and the Eye Doctor in terms of looking what they were sharing online and improving my own learning during my period year. Because I'm very much a visual learner and I realized by only seeing stuff for yourself you can understand everything a little bit more and it's the same reason we do events like this so for instance when patient um, when my colleagues that have been at the event today have been sharing case studies at CET imaging alongside the case history forms a huge part of um, that professional development for optometrists as well obviously we some of us especially when we work in between areas we have groups where we might share cases with each other to help improve our diagnosis and the management of these patients 
And obviously, more so again with COVID at the minute, imaging allows us to analyze images remotely and engage in remote care with these patients to allow us to efficiently triage these patients and even remote manage these patients and make efficient and safe use of the practice face-to-face -face time as well. So what we're going to go through first of all is setting up your set lamp and the basics that we need to look at when we try and take an image. Now, it would be easy if it was just click and shoot, shoot situation, but as if any of you have tried imaging using your phone, you'll know that it isn't as simple as just clicking and shooting. There's a little bit more setup that goes into it. And with these few tips and tricks that I'm going to give you next, it'll help you image well with practice. So the first thing we're going to talk about is alignment. Now, you don't need any fancy adapter, but you'll realize if you ever tried taking an image with your hand, it's really hard to get a steady image in order to take an image well on your phone. For this reason, I use a standard slit lamp adapter, which I got off Amazon, which just holds my phone steady. The main mistake people make here is clipping on the adapter and having the camera push right against the eyepiece. What you want with the uh, where the camera's sitting, you want to sit in the same position where your eyes would normally sit during an examination. So you can see it's just a little bit further back from the, uh, the eyepiece there. And what you're going to be looking for is that full circular aperture on your phone. So I've got two images here down. The one on the left here shows perfect alignment. So this is where the image has completely filled the aperture on the camera and you're getting all the detail that you need to look at in the images. Whereas with poor alignment, whether this be too close to the eyepiece or too far away, you're going to get these dark faded edges and only a very small portion of the image that's actually clear. clear. Now, in the beginning, it's going to take a bit of practice and it might take you a few minutes to set the slit lamp camera, uh, the camera up well. With practice and with over time and the more you get used to imaging with the phone, you can get this down to a few seconds very quickly. Once you've got that initial setup done, like I can clip my phone on during the examination now and be done within a couple of minutes doing the from start to finish. The next thing we're going to talk about is how your test room needs to be set up. So you want to keep your test room as dark as possible for the best images because this removes any unwanted reflections and prevents overexposure of your images or lens fair problems when trying to image. It's really important that particularly any screens that are located behind you, you turn off them, turn them, turn them, off, turn them off. Otherwise, you're going to get reflections on the corneas, which you don't want when you're imaging. When it comes to magnification, we're going to be using the magnification drum on the set lamp. And particularly in the beginning stages, you want to use low or medium magnification when you're just starting out. Reason being, this imaging isn't that sensitive to shifts in focus or alignment or exposure. So you can get the basics down, refine your technique before trying more difficult imaging at high magnification. A good point to note here is that with iPhones, the imaging is much less magnified on the camera than it what appears with the naked eye. So for instance, you might try and take an image times 10. With, uh, you might look through the eyepieces and look at something generally in times 10. But when you put the camera in front of the eyepiece, it almost looks like a time six image. For that reason, whenever you're imaging something, always go a step up on the drum to what you typically would use to look at the uh, pathology with your naked eye. And again, with this magnification, it all comes down to practicing, to getting down to that focus. Especially at high magnification, remember that less is more. So remember, you only want fine shifts in focus and exposure. And this will give you that real crisp detail that you're looking for. I remember the higher the magnification that you go, the brighter the illumination on the slit lamp needs to be as well. So here I've got two examples of images. On the left-hand side, we've got a corneal scarring viewed at time six. Here you see it's really, even though what a time six would normally look like through a slit lamp, this is really um, zoomed out. And you've got a high magnification image of blepharitis on the right-hand side as well. If you're going to take anything to, away from today's lecture, it'd be this slide here. This slide here is the key and the most important slide in this whole lecture because when I found out this, when I, was talk, when I learned imaging myself, this saved my imaging and made my imaging 10 times better than what it was before that. So phones naturally autofocus and adjust the exposure constantly to try and give you the best image when you're just taking pictures with your camera normally. We want to turn this off to image well with a slit lamp because essentially what we want to do by locking the focus, this locks the focus at one particular point and then allows us to use our slit lamp as we normally would during an examination to focus. And this is really helpful for just some fine shifts in focus to capture that detail that we're really looking for. Locking the exposure prevents lens flare and overexposure. As we know, our slit lamp um, illuminations are very bright. So by locking this exposure, we can get, keep good control over that illumination. And, the, and it means we keep the detail in the images and it's not lost to overexposure. Remembering that as we go through, you're going to change your exposure and your focus levels depending on the type of capture that you're trying to do. So to do this on your phone, most of the time it's holding down the screen for five seconds you'll see this box that says AEFF lock at the top of the screen, and you'll have a yellow box with a sunshine next to it. That yellow sunshine allows you to manually control the exposure of the imaging, 
and um, the AF for lock means that your phone's locked in that position so that you can just focus with your slit lamp as well. Remember, each time you change magnification or your illumination technique, you need to reset or relock the focus ex and exposure. And again, in the first few times you take your images, it'll take you a good few minutes, and the first couple of shots will be absolutely rubbish. Again, with practice, with time, you'll get very proficient at this, and you'll be able to image well within a few seconds as well. Now, this slide looks a bit scary, but it's basically just talking you through your slit lamp illumination techniques. So, for general structures of the adnexa, the conjunctiva, and the iris, we want to be using diffuse illumination. It's not great for imaging fine details such as the cornea, the anterior chamber, lens, or vitreous. But again, it's a perfect starting point, just getting used to imaging with your phone, making sure you've got your alignment right, your exposure is not too bright, and you're getting the focusing on the detail really well. Again, if your slit lamp's got a built-in diffuser, perfect. This is what you want to use. But if you if you haven't, then just a full slit width and height and just keep your brightness really low on your illumination arm. But again, this will be a much sharper brightness than what you would typically want with a diffuser. Keep the illumination arm at an angle to avoid overexposed or bleached images as well. The next technique is retroillumination. This is by far probably one of the most difficult techniques to image and image well. This technique is incredibly prone to overexposure and lens flare problems because of how bright you're keeping your illumination arm and the reflections of the cornea that come naturally. This technique is best used for um, visualizing transillumination defects or endothelial changes. So for this, you want to keep your illumination arm straight on. Your slit beam and height just want small, just smaller than the pupil. Moderate to max illumination. And with this one, it's really important that you use your right eyepiece to the left, uh, patient's left eye and vice versa. Again, you can decouple your slit lamp to remove unwanted reflections. And you notice with a lot of the imaging that we do, you may not decouple your slit lamp on a normal day-to-day -day basis, but it's incredibly important and useful when you're imaging just uh, with a phone camera to just remove them reflections just by decoupling ever so slightly. Control over exposure is essential with this technique. And like I said, that sunshine icon, you want to drop it right down just to keep control over the exposure in the images as well. Next up, your technique is direct illumination. So this is best technique for imaging structures from the front of the eye at the cornea right to the back of the vitreous. It tends to bleach finer detail, particularly in the cornea, but there's no one way to use this technique. You can use a variety of illuminations, slit height, slit width, depending on what you what is you're imaging. You've got to have a good control over focus and alignment and managing your imaging and focus at different magnifications in order to do the um, image well. And remember, it's very the higher magnification, particularly a direct, is very sensitive to subtle shifts in focus as well. Lastly, we've got indirect illumination. So this is the best technique for imaging corneal pathology or anything to do with contact lenses in particular, because that detail is often bleached out by direct illumination. This technique removes unwanted reflections in any technique that you're using as well. So best way to use this technique is to focus directly on the area you want to image with direct illumination, and then just decouple your illumination adjacent to that area but you're still maintaining focus on the area that you want to image. But this brings the detail that you're looking at into much more clarity and takes away that bleaching effect of the bright light. You want to adjust your focus lock if you need to on that area indirectly that you're um, observing. And particularly with this technique, at higher magnification, it's very difficult to capture because, you, that, because of that depth of focus issue as well. Point to note is illumination used for slit lamp photography needs to be much brighter than typically used during examination, so be sure to warn the patient of that as well. So next, we're going to take you through the general structures of the eyes and talk you through a few tips and tricks of imaging those structures uh, generally. And I'll also show you a few of my images that I've taken as well. So firstly, starting with the, my favorite structure to image. Now, cataracts are commonly seen in practice and maybe not, maybe not be the most interesting pathology, but it's the perfect starting point to image and refine your technique. You may practice on diffuse first, just on the general lids, but once you've got a handle on the technique, this is a perfect technique, to, uh, perfect pathology to look at in order to start imaging well and capturing a lot of that detail. So you can see here, I've got three examples of cataracts here. We've got a nuclear sclerotic cataract seen with direct illumination, and then a posterior subcapsular and a cortical cataract seen with retro illumination as well, all at varying magnifications. These are best, uh, easiest to capture dilated, but with practice, you can actually capture um, lens opacities and dilated as well. To image uh, lens opacity well, you want to focus on the cornea first of all, and then shift your focus forward onto the anterior lens capsule. Refocus your exposure and your focus lock on the lens. For direct, keep your full beam height and the slit width about two to three millimeters and then the median of illumination. For retro, keep the beam and the height uh, width just smaller than the pupil and moderate to max illumination. So 
Again, you can see here on the direct one, I've got a full slip beam there, but I'm focused on the crystalline lens there, so you can see the nuclear cataract. Whereas on the second image of the cortical cataract, I've got a really small beam, but a very bright illumination. So we get that reflection off the back of the eye, and you can see the cortical cataract really detailed with the retroillumination. Again, with every technique I'm going to mention now, decouple when necessary to move unwanted reflections and give you a much more crisp image. The next structure we're going to talk about is the iris. And like I said earlier, iris transillumination is one of the most difficult techniques to image well due to the um, technique being prone to overexposure and lens flare. So to image iris transillumination well, you want to keep the room as dark as possible, your slit height and width just smaller than the pupil, max illumination, and you want to lock your focus on exposure on the area of transillumination, not the area where your illumination is shining through the pupil. Decouple the slit lamp to a room and one any unwanted reflections or lens flares. So you can see on the image on the right there, the iris, iris transillumination defect. I'm focused and that yellow box is focused on the areas tra area of transillumination. And my beam is very small going directly through the pupil, but very bright. So we get that really crisp transillumination defect on the iris. For any other pathologies of the iris, whether that be nodules, cyniki, or rubiosis in this case, then you want to use diffuse illumination. And even in the absence of pathology, uh, capturing the iris is a really good point to start imaging at high magnification, particularly when you're looking at the pupil margin itself, because that's really uh, that's really fine detail that you'll be able to see whether or not you're in or out of focus. Because a lot of times when imaging at high magnification, you can think you're in focus, but a lot of times you're still focused on the cornea and not anything further back as well. Next bit we're going to talk about is the general adnexus. So this is by far the easiest part of the eye to image. And it's a perfect starting point for anybody to image because most of the time you're using diffuse illumination. So very basic imaging technique. So illumination at an angle to avoid overexposure using a diffuser and your brightness of your slit lamp depends on your magnification. But as you can see here, this is probably a technique, particularly those of you involved in dry eye clinics or any MEX clinics, a technique you'll often use quite regularly to document various pathologies, especially in direct dry eye clinics. This can really be really helpful to document the condition of the patient's lashes and this can follow through with the patient as they come for multiple follow-ups. It's perfect for documenting anything to do with ocular surface disease in general because as we know patients with dry eyes can be quite temperamental and expect drops and uh, um, lid hygiene to work with them overnight. So with this at least you can document and show the patient the visual improvement in the state of their eyes between visits as well. Next, next structure we'll talk about is the conjunctiva. So similar to the agnex, it's fairly easy to image. The technique's not too hard. So using diffuse illumination, your illumination's at an angle again to avoid overexposure, and your brightness depends on your magnification as well. For any lesions on the conjunctiva, particularly anything that appears raised, you want to use direct or indirect illumination to see the depth of that. So the imaging again here, it's to do with that patient management. Again, with MEX, we're dealing with a lot more pathology in, patient, uh, in patients and managing a lot more in practice than we typically would before. So the imaging allows you to be able to compare whether it's redness at um, initial presentation and follow-up. So say with the patient that presented to you with episcleritis, you can then see the improvement in that patient over time or any changes over time as well. And again, this helps that triage staff at the hospital when referring through because they can see what you're talking about in your letter as well. So for instance, this patient here in the first image has circumlibral injection. He also had interior chamber cells and flares, so this is something we were referring for uveitis to something as simple as a subconjunctival hemorrhage in the image next to it. The OS 3.0 software has a benefit of providing objective grading um, for these patients, so it allows you to grade the redness of these patients, so you get an objective and more accurate assessment, and this means you get an objective measure of improvement between visits rather than subjective grading, because we know as ourselves, when we grade even something like an optic disc, even between two visits, you might get a, diff um, a different result in your own grading, even when there's been no changes to the nerve itself. Same can be said of grading the front of the eye as well. So again, this objective measure is really important in refining that patient management side of things. Capturing the cornea. So the cornea is probably the most difficult structure to image in image well. And reason being is it's getting that fine detail. You, your focus has to be on point, your alignment has to be on point, and your illumination needs to be um, not too bright, but bright enough so that the detail comes through. So to image something on the cornea very well, you need to use a mixture of direct and indirect illumination, depending on what you're imaging. Your slit height, a full slit height, about 12 millimeters, and slit width, about 3 millimeters wide as well. You want to use moderate illumination, and you want to focus directly on the area that you wish to image. Drop your exposure, so using that sunshine icon, drop the exposure down and decouple when necessary to prevent bleaching. So in the three images that I've got here, in the first one you can see there's a corneal ulcer. 
Um, this is seen with direct illumination. In the second image there, you've got keratic precipitate. So you can see in the area directly next to the beam, you can see the keratic precipitates in a lot more detail than you can do directly in the beam. And in the last image there, you've got a mix of direct and indirect. So you can see the opacities with the granular dystrophy, both in the direct section and the indirect areas as well. So again, imaging allows us to document any lesions or signs of pathology, which are useful for monitoring management or referral of these patients as well. The same way we would use posterior imaging as well. Next, we'll go into fluorescein imaging. So the key to fluorescein imaging is controlling the exposure to prevent the loss of details especially given the fact that particularly the cobalt blue filter um, bleaches a lot of the uh, detail with the eye, but you get the fluorescence that you're looking for. Using a rattan filter can massively improve the clarity of your fluorescence. So to image successfully, you want a full slit height and width, maximum illumination with the cobalt blue filter, but you want to focus your exposure and then bring the exposure right down to image well. You can use the diffuser if the image is appearing very overexposed and you're losing a lot of that detail. So I've got two examples of images here. The first image, you've got a cobalt blue filter um, without a rattan filter, and you can see the ulcer uh, fluorescing really brightly there. But the general structures around the eye aren't that easy uh, visible to see. On the second image with a rattan filter, you can see two marginal ulcers there, again, with a lot more detail of the eye visible using the rattan filter, so it's really helpful. The AOS 3.0 software has a staining grading um, tool and a uh, fluorescein thickness measurement tool to allow you to objectively grade the staining to help in the management of your patients. It also has a built-in rattan filter if you don't have one built into your slit lamp to enhance the imaging of your fluorescein imaging on the app itself. Imaging again here allows you to document any lesions or signs which are useful for monitoring, management and referral of the patients. So now you've taken these amazing images, what you're going to do with it. So. This is where I introduce you to the AOS 3.0 software, which will allow you to take your imaging to the next level. So using the points we touched on about why do we image, we're going to talk about patient education, patient management, and peer education and safety. So the main features of the AOS 3.0 software are bulbar redness grading, lid redness grading, and corneal staining grading as well. You've got a few image enhancement tools on there, so you can annotate and draw on the images to note anything of interest. You can use a red free filter to enhance blood vessels, but also they have a separate enhanced tool which will enhance them blood vessels as well to allow you to see them more visibly. There's a built-in rattan filter, which will uh, you can put over cobalt blue images if you don't have one available to you in practice. And there's a ruler tool which allows you to measure, whether it be uh, measure the size of an ulcer, measure the size of an abrasion, to measuring neovascular contact lens patient. There's many tools here which can really aid your assessment. Just add value to the assessment because you can do this all in front of the patient, which adds uh, benefit to the patient experience in practice to show that they're getting value and the importance of their health with the eyes as well. The app, uh, there's an app, there's a patient app and a practitioner's app and all the AOS software is fully GDPR compliant and everything's stored in the app which means you're not faffing with sending emails to yourself or anything being stored on your phone. Everything's stored within the, within the app and can be transferred directly to the patient file. So on the topic of patient education, this allows patients to take ownership of their own treatment when numbers are given to analyze um, whatever's going on with their eyes. And this can allow the patient to monitor themselves. So for instance, when a patient goes to GP and they're taking blood pressure readings or blood sugar readings in a diabetic, they get obviously objective measures of what their blood pressure or blood sugar is like. And over visits, follow up, you can see how that changes. The same can be said of an eye. So whether that's staining over time in a dry eye patient and they can objectively see the improvement or the change in the worsening in the eye, same way with anything with red eye, changes over time. It gives that patient objective grading of their own eye, not just a diagram, so that they can take ownership of their own health. The reporting tool within the AOS software allows the patient to get a full comprehensive report of their visit from start to finish, whether that be from triage to pre-screen to full assessment and follow-up, so the patient gets a comprehensive result of the outcome. And you're able, like I said, any time you can show the patient their own eye over a diagram, they're gonna pay much more attention. The same way, if you point to a diagram in the test room of an eye, but you show them an actual fundus picture, the patients are really intrigued and really engaged in what they're seeing as well. Again, at the bottom here, we've just got some examples of some of the software. So I've graded a patient with episcleritis that presented in practice there. The patient you saw earlier with the circle limbal injection, we've used a redness map, so you can see how that injection is very much located on that limbal margin, and we've got a redness grading of a lid as well. In regards to patient management, the objective measures of scoring 
Um, over clinician, subjective grading is better for the patient management because you've got objective measures between visits. Like I said earlier, your own grading between two visits, even with the same eye, can be very variable. So you're removing that variability, which improves and refines the patient management. This is only improved when you're working within a um, team of multiple clinicians and where you have to um, shift patient care between multiple clinicians as well. You've got objective measures there and you've got visual um, images so the patients can be handled well, even if you're handing over care to a, um, a colleague. We know how frustrating, again, with dry eye management, I'm always going to come back to this because it's probably the biggest one and the biggest pro of imaging, is patients feel a lot of times they should see an improvement immediately. And especially when it comes to follow-up, these patients can be quite defeated. Again, by showing the patients the objective improvement and the side-by-side -side images of the improvements in their lids, the state of their meibomium glands and the staining of the eyes, this can give the patient that motivation and the encouragement that they need to um, persevere with the treatment and it improves patient compliance in that regard. Again, it's standard, uh, the software creates a full patient pathway for you, like I said, because everything can be done in the app. So from triage, pre-screening, full assessment and follow-up. So you're not having to faff with multiple different patient management softwares. You can do everything within the app and it's a really good tool um, and really professional from start to finish from the patient because they're not faffing with multiple different um, systems to try and get seen and to try and get managed as well. From a peer education point of view, again, especially um, with case studies like this, these are really important as a learning tool between peers because you can present a case to your colleagues within practice or at a CET event and you can show the objective improvements with time and how your treatment, um, whether you change the treatment or you devise the treatment for the patient and what effect it had on the patient as well. Similarly to delegated functions in practice, so at the minute we delegate pictures, OCT, visual fields and normal pre-screening to our colleagues. There's no reason why we can't train our colleagues to take the basic images, but the same way we would do in practice and take over the more advanced imaging, whether that's OCD and fundus imaging, the advanced slit lamp imaging you would take over yourself, but especially at the point of triage, there's no reason why colleagues couldn't be trained to take images alongside the triage to improve that triaging process and free up chair time um, especially in these times where chair time is so valuable and so limited. Again, you reduce, within this COVID safe protocols, patients might be quite anxious to come into practice. So what you can do within the app is video call or request patients to send you images alongside that triage process. So you can do as much of the assessment remotely as possible and therefore maximizing that in uh, and maximizing that in-person face-to-face time and keeping the time down so it's efficient and the patients feel safe um, during this current pandemic as well. Again, if you can get your slit lamp set up well, what it means is that you can set your slit lamp up with the phone camera permanently, and it means it allows you to take a bit more of a step back when you're imaging and use the iPhone screen or the camera screen as your own viewing port rather than getting up to slit lamp. It allows you a bit more working distance between the patients, especially during these pandemic times. Again, at the bottom here, I've got an example of a patient who I saw just a few weeks ago. He was having a preservative toxicity reaction to the preservatives in his glaucoma medication. And you can see here we've got the highlighted the corneal staining tools here. So you've got just general staining grading. You've got the staining grid, which grades it in five different quadrants. And then you've got the thickness map as well on the side. Now, not for the faint hearted, but once you've got your technique down, we can do move into the more fun imaging and the more advanced imaging. These are the techniques and images that I've only taken in the last year or so. So it took me a good couple of years to refine my technique, just imaging the general pathology and the basic stuff first. But once you get that down, you can move into the more advanced captures. So the first advanced capture we're gonna talk about is to capturing anterior chamber. So I don't know about you guys, but when I was at university, this was only ever something we were talked uh, talk about in a textbook. We were never actually shown images of cells in the anterior chamber. It's not something I saw for myself until I went on my hospital placement. Uh, so be able to image this well was really helpful as an educational tool to share through my page, especially for students, because like I said, when you see something for the first time, it kind of just clicks. So same way in practice, this can be a great tool for educating your peers, whether you have trainees in practice, such as pre-regis or student optometrists as well. So imaging the anterior chamber is very challenging and it's best done via video capture first before attempting any still imaging. So to set this up, you want to set your iPhone to 4K 60 frame per second video capture. This is the highest setting on your iPhone. Your slit height wants to be one to two millimeters with a full slit width. On my keyless slit lamp, I've got a one millimeter square, which I find very useful. Moderate to max illumination. Your angle illumination wants to be about 30 degrees. Your magnification about 16 times to 25 times. And you're gonna lock your exposure and your focus on the video, similarly you would do to still imaging. 
you want to focus on the cornea first of all and then move through the anterior chamber until you're anterior, on the anterior lens capsule and you're analyzing that area between the two areas of focus again this technique's best done dilated because you can use the blackness of the pupil as a background to really image well but as you can see on the right hand side even in an undilated pupil with practice you can image cells and flare really well this technique again is limited by what equipment you're using so if again if you want to attempt slit lamp captures using a phone you need a good slit lamp behind you as well um an old 15 year old with a halogen bulb isn't really going to cut it especially if you've got an led slit lamp it's really helpful when it comes to imaging these more, more advanced structures what i've got coming up next is a few videos that i've taken so you can see these in a bit more detail so here we've got a patient presenting with cells in the anterior chamber So as you can see there, you can see the cells moving really clearly through the anterior chamber. And uh, this was a cataract post-op patient. And just as another example, this one slowed down a bit. So this is a smaller aperture, but a bit brighter. And you'll see as I move through the anterior chamber, you can see the cells there. So, alongside the anterior chamber, what's, a, what's classed as an advanced capture, in my opinion, is capturing the vitreous and capturing it well. So imaging the vitreous, again, is challenging in the beginning, but the, best, the technique, again, is best done with video capture. The patient must be dilated for this, otherwise you're not really going to image anything too well. To successfully image the vitreous, you want to set your iPhone, again, to those highest video settings. Your slit height, about 7 to 9 millimeters, just smaller than the dilated pupil, so you don't get any unwanted corneal reflections. Two to three millimeter slit width and a moderate to max illumination. Your angle of illumination at about 10 to 20 degrees and magnification about 16 to 25 times. You wanna lock your exposure and focus similar to still imaging again. And this time you wanna focus on the posterior lens and then move further back into the vitreous to image it well. Get the patient to look up, down, and straight ahead to move the vitreous around so you can image uh, it well. Again, decoupling can help sometimes get a clearer image, especially if you're getting a lot of reflections off the cornea. Here I've got three examples of stills I've taken. So one of asteroid hylosis, one of Schaefer's sign, and one of the vitreous hemorrhage. And I've got the accompanying videos coming up now. So first we'll look at Schaefer's sign, tobacco dust. So this was something I'd quite chuffed to image because it's the first time I'd actually seen it properly myself on the slit lamp. And I was able to image it quite well. So if we look at the video here, so you've got the white strands of the vitreous and in there you've got the brown pigment of the Schaefer sign as well. Next, we have a vitreous hemorrhage. This was on my old phone, so the imaging quality isn't as good as what it was on that one. But again, as the patient looks up and down, you can see the blood move in the vitreous there. That's not a red reflex, that's all blood in the vitreous cavity. And lastly, one of my favorite things to see in practice personally, but asteroid hylosis always looks amazing, especially when imaged well. I hope that's given you a good starting point to start imaging your cells and gives you a few tips and tricks to get started. Like I said, it really is about practice, patience and perseverance with imaging. But obviously, if there's anything I can help you with, feel free to drop me a message on the page. And obviously, if anybody's got any questions now, I'm happy to take any questions. And I invite Jeff and Natalie to get involved. I think they're going to take you through a small demo of the AOS app as well. Thank you very much.